Every Boxing Day, in a small corner of Surrey, thousands take a break from the Christmas festivities in order to bear witness to one of the pillars of the national hunt season, the King George VI chase. Only the best win the King George. A role of honour includes the leading lights of the sport, both human and equine. Less than a century old, the memories from this race have created a lifetime of fans for the sport. Whether you've been once or 50 times, you never forget your first. And Cordo Star lights up Kempton. Few occasions in this great sport of ours set the pulses racing and the spines tingling quite like Kempton Park's Boxing Day showpiece, the King George VI chase. If Cheltenham's Blue Ribbon is all about stamina, guts and determination, then the King George VI chase is where class will out and where sometimes top-class two-milers transform themselves into staying chasers of the highest calibre. From humble pre-war beginnings in 1937, and originally run in February, where the Jimmy Rank-owned Southern hero took the first renewal of the race named in honour of Her Majesty the Queen's father, the King George has been regarded as second only to the Cheltenham Gold Cup. First moved to Boxing Day in 1947, the following year the brilliant Cottage Rake became the first great steeplechaser to grace the King George Roll of Honour. Since then it has played host to a galaxy of superstars from across both sides of the Irish Sea and the English Channel. We now look back at some of those achievements. In 1982, the year Wayward Lad first lined up at Kempton Park, the King George was fast becoming the preserve of the Dickinson family. Father Tony had held a licence when Gay Spartan and Silver Buck won in 1978 and 1979 respectively, while son Michael had taken the helm by the time of Silver Buck's second victory in the race in 1980. With the 81 renewal lost to Snow, Wayward Lad made his King George debut as a seven-year-old against his better fancied stable companion Silver Buck, who, at the age of 10, had added the 1982 Cheltenham Gold Cup to his CV since his last King George appearance two years earlier and was sent off the even money favourite behind another Gold Cup winner, Little Owl, second choice in the market at 5-2. Wayward Lad was at times a spectacular jumper, however, lingering concerns about his ability to stay the three mile trip meant he was sent off the 7-2 third favourite. Continuing but tailed off, so into the home straight then, three to jump. And it's Silver Buck in the lead from Little Owl. $50 more going very well in between these two. Then Wayward Lad coming down to the third from home. Silver Buck from $50 more. Little Owl looks beaten three out. Silver Buck from $50 more. Then Wayward Lad and Little Owl coming down to the second from home. In this, a King George of Six chase. And Silver Buck being challenged by $50 more. And Wayward Lad, Silver Buck, $50 more. Wayward Lad, just one more fence to jump. And the Dickinson pair with Silver Buck and Wayward Lad being challenged by $50 more available to choose between the three. Wayward Lad on the near side, Silver Buck on the far side. $50 more in between these two as they jump the final fence. They're in the air together, they touch down together. $50 more, Wayward Lad and Silver Buck. And it's Wayward Lad on the near side.
Wayward, $50 more fighting back. Wayward lad from $50 more in silver buck. Wayward lad, $50 more silver buck. Wayward lad wins it from $50 more in second place. Then came silver buck in third. These three well clear from mid round. Whilst Wayward Lad's stamina around Kempton was now unquestionable, the additional two and a half furlong climb at Cheltenham was beyond him and he would never add a gold cup to his impressive tally. But his Kempton adventure was only just beginning. Twelve months on, and with Robert Earnshaw replacing John Frankham, who had been claimed by Fred Winter to ride the Sun Alliance Chase and Hennessy Gold Cup winner Brown Chamberlain, Wayward Lad was sent off the 11-8 favourite. More impressive than the previous year, he became the sixth dual winner of the King George. Second, the mighty mighty third, as they come down the final fence of the King George chase, at uh, which mighty uh, wayward lad jumped it very smoothly and in the lead, going on from Brown James and as they come up towards the line, wayward lad's going to win it by some three to four legs, wayward lad's going to win it at the line, wayward lad is the winner from Brown James and his second. Defeat followed in 1984 when tailed off last of three behind the great Borough Hill lad, and by 1985, it seemed as though the now 10-year-old wayward lad's chance of a record third King George had gone. Borough Hill lad bidding for his own double in the race was a warm order at 4-5, to five, whilst Coombe's ditch, denied by a short head 12 months earlier, was 3-1. Three to one. Three out, a good jump from Borough Hill lad, the Coombe ditch getting close. All of wayward lad's best form had come on decent ground, so a combination of advancing years and a going officially described as heavy saw him go off 12-1. to one. Under a positive Graham Bradley, he showed not only class, but sheer guts and determination to provide the sort of emotional spectacle Boxing Day race fans have grown accustomed to. Wayward lad, but Coombs Ditch now the challenger. Wayward lad and Coombs Ditch in the air together, touch down together. Who shows a better turn of foot? Wayward lad, what a grand old campaigner. Coombs Ditch looks like he's going to be second in the game, but he's fighting back. We're coming up towards the line. Wayward lad and Coombs Ditch. Wayward lad and Coombs Ditch. Wayward lad wins it just from Coombs Ditch in a photo. Going head-to-head -head with Leopardstown's St. Stephen's Day fixture has often robbed the Kempton Park showpiece of the sort of Anglo-Irish rivalry we have grown accustomed to seeing at Presbury Park in March. The mighty cottage rake gave Ireland its first King George back in 1948. But 17 years elapsed before a second Irish victor graced Kempton Park's Boxing Day winner's enclosure. The horse in question was by then simply known as himself. And here is Arkel coming up to the second line. Already the winner of two Cheltenham Gold Cups, Arkel was lining up for only his first King George in 1965. He had remained in Ireland in 1963, winning Leopardstown's Christmas Handicap Chase, while 12 months later, Cheltenham's Massey Ferguson Gold Cup had been the December target set by Tom Draper for his superstar. Sent off the 1-7 to odds-on favourite, Arkel tranced dormant by a distance. Now in his prime, little did we know what would befall the horse, many still believe to be the greatest steeplechaser of all time at the same venue 12 months on. Arkel was once again sent off a very short-priced favourite for the 1966 renewal. According to Pat Taff, he believes his old friend struck the guardrail off a fence with his off four hoof, fracturing the pedal bone. Such was his courage that he still led dormant over the final fence, only to slow to a virtual walk. Arco would never race again. By 1974, Arkel's jockey Pat Taff had started training and had in his care the mercurial and enigmatic Captain Christie. Jane Samuel's gelding oozed class, having already won an Irish sweeps hurdle in the 1974 Cheltenham Gold Cup. Many observers had felt that last victory was fortuitous, as the odds-on favourite Pendle had capsized when going easily three fences from home. Pendle had already won the previous two renewals off the King George, and it was now felt that the hat-trick was a mere formality. 
Smith now in the King George. Pendley is quick. He's going to maintain that record all right. Dick Pittman looks over his left shoulder. There's no danger whatever. The Dickler chasing him home and coming up towards the line. Pendle with... And Pendle cruising up to join Inkslinger. Inkslinger on the far side, on the left, from Pendle on the near side, then the Dickler. And it's Pendle now, ears pricked towards the right of the picture. Inkslinger, the white cap, towards the far side, Tommy Carberry. Pendle's going to touch down just in the lead, he does. But Dick Pittman has hit the front plenty early enough. And he doesn't like to be in front too long, this horse, but he's only cantering. This is real class, this is. Here's Pendle, unbeaten in five races at Kenton, coming to win his second King George VI chase. Another beautiful jump, he's right away from the fence. He's striding up towards the line now. And Dick Pittman and Pendle going away from him, slinger over on the far side, and Dick away back in crowd and up the line. Pendle is the winner. Pendle was sent off the 4-7 on favourite to avenge that Cheltenham Gold Cup defeat. Captain Christie, now ridden by Bobby Coonan replacing the retired Bobby Beasley, changing the hold-up tactics adopted at Cheltenham, the partnership made all to beat Pendle fairly and squarely by eight lengths. A year later, and it was more of the same. The injured Coonan was replaced by stable claimer Jerry Newman. Six lengths clear of his field at halfway, the scorching gallop set by his inexperienced rider proving ideal, the captain beat the dual champion hurdler Bula by a resounding 30 lengths. Shortly afterwards, Lord Oaksey announced, I honestly believe it fair to call this the finest performance seen by a steeplechaser since Arkell. It would be another 26 years before Ireland would once again taste King George success. With a festival bumper and RSA chase already to his name, Florida Pearl was the first truly great steeplechaser to be housed at Willie Mullins's Clusutton base in County Carlow. Burdened with the label of the next Arkle, this strapping bay failed to live up to such lofty and unfair expectations. By the time of the 2001 King George, he had already been defeated in two Cheltenham Gold Cups, as well as the previous season's King George. Richard Dunwoody, on board for both the Festival Bumper and RSA Chase, was now retired, and Florida Pearl had mainly been ridden by Paul Carberry and Ruby Walsh during the past two seasons. However, both preferred to remain in Ireland on this particular Boxing Day. JP McNamara, a young jockey based with Ferdy Murphy, agreed to take the ride aboard Florida Pearl. But then fate took an unexpected turn when first Weatherby, where Ferdy's stable jockey Adrian McGuire was headed, and then Market Raisin, to where McGuire was rerouting, were both abandoned. McGuire got the call at 12 noon with the King George scheduled for 2.20 p.m. Luckily for Adrian Maguire and Willie Mullins, traffic on the M1 was clear and Maguire made Kempton Park with over an hour to spare. Under a fearless and positive ride, Adrian Maguire filled his partner with more and more confidence at every fence and Florida Pearl finally landed that elusive first really iconic success on British shores. Move forward, but Florida Pearl still going strongly in front. Florida Pearl got in a bit tight over two out. Back and now landed second. Best mate trying to challenge between the pair. They race down towards the final fence. Can Florida Pearl win the King George? He's two lengths clear. Here's Best mate challenging under Tony McCoy. Florida Pearl sails over the last. Best mate now got a fight on his hooves on the outside. Florida Pearl, can he hang on today? Best mate in second. Similar to three of the four previous Irish-trained King George winners, Kicking King boasted a Cheltenham Gold Cup success alongside his two wins in the Boxing Day Spectacular. Trained by Tom Taff, son of the legendary Pat Taff, forever associated with Arkell and trainer of Captain Christie, Kicking King was campaigned almost exclusively at two miles as a novice 
going down by only a length to the top class well chief in the previous season's Arkle Trophy Chase. An easy winner of the John Durkin Chase at Punchestown three weeks earlier, the son of Old Vic was running over three miles for only the second time in his career when contesting the 2004 King George. Kicking King would have to survive a dramatic final fence blunder plus the appearance of an unexpected, albeit seasonal, interloper to win his first King George chase. And racing down towards the final fence is Kicking King and Barry Geraghty, a star emerging here at Kempton Park. Kicking King short. Oh, Three months later, Kicking King would win the Cheltenham Gold Cup before going on to win a second King George, this time at Sandown Park. Sadly, injury would rob us of seeing Kicking King ever reach such dizzying heights again. But the question is, how far dare these fellows let Desert Orchid go? because David Ellsworth doesn't think he'll come back to them. Wayward Lad had raised the bar when winning a record third King George in 1985, and at the grand old age of 12, would bid to make it four in 1986. If asked for a contender who might one day surpass Wayward Lad's record, few people would have nominated David Ellsworth's effervescent and immensely popular grey Desert Orchid from the field that lined up for the 1986 running. Essentially a two-miler, Desi had won four of his nine novice chases, finishing third in the Arkle, and in his second season over fences, was two from three going into the King George. Moreover, David Ellsworth's stable jockey Colin Brown, who had ridden the Flying Grey in all bar one of his previous races, deserted him in order to remain loyal to the stable companion Coombs Ditch, already a runner-up in the two previous King Georges, and, unlike Desi, had proven stamina reserves. Little surprise then, that Desi was sent off 16 to 1. One might have expected a doubtful stayer such as Desi to be ridden with such restraint to get the trip, but as he legged him up in the paddock, David Ellsworth had advised Colin Brown's replacement, Simon Sherwood, to ride him as if he'll stay Simon. The rest, as they say, is history. Forgive and forget, they've got three to jump. It's Desert Orchid, forgive and forget. Then comes Dorlax, followed by Berlin's Cross and Coombs Ditch and Wayward Lad won't be winning. But Desert Orchid is in the clear lead as it comes down towards the second last. It's Desert Orchid over safely. Prompt forgive and forget the top chaser in the country held in second place. Dorlatch is third, Bernard's cross four. Coombs Ditch is being pulled up, but it's his stable companion Desert Orchid who's clear as they come down towards the 19th and final fence in this King George VI, the ranked steeplechase. At the last, Desert Orchid jumps it well. Desert Orchid clear from forgive and forget and Dorlatch as they race up towards the line. It's Desert Orchid for an amazing pillar to post win in this top class chase. Desert Orchid comes home well clear. Let the post Desert Orchid is the winner. As we'll see later, Desi's bid for a double would be thwarted in 1987. However, he returned to Kempton on Boxing Day 1988, where this time his odds were much shorter. A four-length victory over Kildemo saw him join such illustrious names when making it two King Georges. By the time of his bid to equal Wayward Lad's record of three in December 1989, Desi had prevailed in one of the most stirring and emotional gold cup victories you were ever likely to see. Unusual by today's standards, he then reverted to two miles to prep for the 1989 King George by trying to concede two stone to three rivals in the Tingle Creek chase, then run as a limited handicap. Sent off the 6-4 on favourite at Kempton, he comfortably accounted for stablemate and crack two-miler Barnbrook again. And so, the record was on. A remarkable fourth King George was within reach. At the age of 11, Desi was bidding to become only the second oldest winner in the race's history, 
but that didn't stop his legion of fans sending him off the 9-4 favourite and simply willing him home. The result was never in doubt. Ryan's going absolutely wild. They've got one to jump, and it's Dennis Orgy comes to take it, and he's jumped it brilliantly. This was his race. Dennis Orgy, what history being made? Rolls of applause. The kings of this counting house. Dennis Orgy's blooming. He's been here before. Dennis Orgy, the winner. Marvellous. Dennis Orgy has won it. Surely this record couldn't be beaten. Before the 1987 renewal of the King George, France had never won the great race. In that season's race, Desi fever had taken hold, and David Ellsworth's ever-popular grey was a warm order to add to the previous season's win in the race. Bo Ranger, the Martin Pipe trained Mackerson Gold Cup winner, was a confirmed front runner, which meant Desert Orchid wasn't going to have it all his own way up front. This set the race up for an unknown French horse, Noop Sala, trained by a man equally unfamiliar to British racegoers. The name of Francois Dumen wouldn't remain obscure on these shores for long. Two men would go on to equal the record of the great Folk Walwyn by winning five King Georges. By far the best of those was dual winner, The Fellow. He first won at the tender age of six, carrying the distinctive red and light green colours of the Marquesa de Moratala, and was allowed to go off at odds of 10 to 1, despite the fact he'd only been beaten a short head in the previous season's Gold Cup, and had then gone back home to win France's premier jumps race, the Grand Steep de Paris. Up against top class two miler remittance man and four time King George winner Desert Orchid, the fellow was produced under a perfectly timed Adam Condra ride with a devastating turn of foot to give France and Dumen their second King George victories. Dumad virtually monopolised the King George between 91 and 94, and Algan provided him with a King George winner number four, largely at the expense of the desperately unlucky Barton Bank. And victory in this race at the last, and he's gone through the top of it, and he's unseated Adrian Maguire, and this goes the whole, he gives it to Algan, who's come through from nowhere to take up the running, and Algan going on from Michelin Cure, down towards the final fence, and Algan's going to take it up towards the line, Algan it is, Algan is the winner, a photo second at close call. Two men then equaled Folk Walwyn's record with first gold six years later, once again sporting the Marquesa's colours. It had taken 29 years for Walwyn's record of five King Georges to be equaled. It would take significantly less for Francois Dumen's record equaling tally to be smashed. When Francois Dumen had equaled Folk Walwyn's record of five King Georges, he must have been long odds on to at least hold on to his share of the spoils. But in the mid-90s, a new force had emerged in the West Country and had already captured the Kempton Park crown twice. Up towards the line, hail a new hero, Seymour Business wins it in second place, challenger to look in third horse home. Seymour Business was the first great horse to be housed at Paul Nichols' Ditchit Yard and supplemented his brace of King George's with victory in the 1999 Cheltenham Gold Cup, providing his young handler with his first victories in the two most prized grade one chases in jumps racing. Seymour Business comes home to win his 11th race, the second time he's taken the potential King George. 
If Francois Dumain had paved the way for French horses to win the Boxing Day highlight, it was with a French bred that Paul Nichols would not only break Woolwyn and Dumain's record, but also that of Desert Orchid, with a horse who needs no introduction. And Quarto Star lights up Kempton, and Quarto Star wins the King George! Now comes the moment of truth, the final fence, the fence that he often fluffs. All eyes on Quarto Star here at Kempton on Boxing Day. And a marvellous jump this time. He cleared it beautifully. And Quarto Star, the Gold Cup winner, is going to win his second King George. What a classy win. Quarto Star is a great horse. So we've been here before. One fence between Quarto Star and King George Glory. in the hands of Ruby Walsh. He's just got to meet it right. Sometimes he makes a blunder. He measures it beautifully. And this is a great, great horse. A horse of tremendous talent, of dogged resolution. What a complete race horse he is. Toto Star wins his fourth King George the Sixth Chase. A wonderful performance. What a horse. in the record book so many times, Cordo Star. Long Run is still trying to close on him, the last. Cordo Star, two lengths ahead, the Long Run in second position. They're heading towards the line, the steeplechaser of a lifetime. Cordo Star is in front, Long Run's closing, but Cordo Star has done it, he's won five King George's. Cordo Star's record of five King George's is one that will surely last for many decades to come but his master trainer isn't finished yet. In 2013 and 2014, Sylvani Arco Conti, yet another French bred, took the Nichols King George total to a truly remarkable nine. Rarely has a top class race been so dominated by one man.